Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. My name is Benji, and I've replaced Patrick with a special guest today, Juliette Labou from Team DSM. How are you feeling coming out of the off-season? Hey, I'm feeling uh, yeah, really good, actually. I had a good winter prep. I had good holidays after the season, and yeah, good training afterwards, good training camps with the team. So yeah, feeling good. When, when were the training camps? Is that in December or is that in January? So yeah, we had one in December, actually, a small week, and we had another one in January or so. So we had uh, two camps, and between that, I went also to south of France, where I'm also right now, to have some better con- better weather conditions uh, than at home. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. Now, you've got those two training camps. Is there a difference between the two? Is the first one more the introduction to your new teammates, or...? Yeah, indeed, especially because we had uh, eight new girls, so we had yeah. to uh, yeah meet in person. We already had some contact, of course, but it was uh, good to yeah to meet everyone, know the personalities and everybody uh, yeah how they are. So it was actually really good. And on the bike, it was also a bit less intense than what we had uh, now in January, yeah. where we had a lot of testing and uh, yeah some race simulation and stuff. So it was uh, more of a race feeling uh, in January. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Now. When you are on that training camp, what does your day roughly look like? Like when you when you when you wake up, what do you do for a day? I normally directly go to breakfast, or sometimes I make coffee before uh, before <laughs> I go to breakfast. It depends. <laughs> uh, and then uh, yeah, go to breakfast, and then we go back to the room. We change, and we then have a morning routine, which is like a mobility session with the girls. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Francis Calcor, who had the responsibility now to do the yeah the routine because she's really good at <laughs> yoga and stretching, so she did it. Yeah. So it was nice. And then we went for a ride, uh, yeah, mostly between three and five and a half hours, something like that. Uh, then we would have lunch uh, by the cooks, and then we either had like busy afternoon or you had not so much. You had sometimes massage, sometimes meeting with the DS or with nutritionist, uh, whoever yeah. was uh, was there for the experts. And then we had a uh, everyday writer's meeting before dinner and then dinner. And sometimes we would play game or so uh, afterwards. Okay, okay, okay. What games do you play? That's that's uh, a good question. Yeah, the, the our favorite is the werewolf. I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, 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 this one is really funny. You sometimes have some fights, but it's <laughs> but it's nice. And otherwise, we have the double. It's a small game where you like have to be really uh, quick. So, yeah, easy thing, yeah. just cards, yeah. This video is brought to you by Zwift. Whether you're just starting out on your cycling journey or are looking for those final tune-ups ahead of a big event or race, Zwift is the online cycling platform that makes things fun. There are nine different worlds, thousands of kilometers of virtual road, including replicas of real-world climbs like Alpe de Zwift. There's workouts, training plans, events, and even races for every level of rider. Zwift's massive community means you're never alone on the road. So if you want to know more about Zwift or want to start your seven-day trial for free, head to Zwift.com below. Okay, now, in 2017, you joined Team Sunweb. You've been there for quite a few years now. You've Mm -hmm. uh, basically grown up in the team, as I would say. Do you feel like it has changed over the years now that you've got Lorena leaving the team, which was also still a young rider, but also Florcha leaving the team and just a general change in the team where you're now one of the more experienced riders in the team? Do you feel like you're now the person people look up to for mentorship? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm uh, one of the oldest now and also the most experienced in the team. So for sure, uh, especially the new girls, they ask a lot of questions. And we are like a few uh, girls like this, like Charlotte yeah. Cole is also, uh, she's still young, but she's also really experienced and uh, is a really good leader. So she also has that uh, role and also Pfeiffer Georgie and uh, yeah, also Francis Cacor has a captain or so. So yeah, we are like four, uh, four, five or so is Megan Jastrap, who is also young, but also yeah. really, uh, yeah. Uh, really good at that so yeah we are a few uh, writers who can uh, really develop the young writers and I feel that uh, yeah I have uh, started uh, in the opposite uh, side when I was really young so yeah, it's nice to now also try to learn the new the new girls. Now I've already spoken about the 2023 season for Natani but when it comes to the transfers but if we look back at how it started for you who or what inspired you when you were young to get into cycling in the first place? In the first place, it was my brother because uh, yeah, he's uh, five years older than me, and he started with uh, BMX racing. Uh, yeah. Thanks to the yeah, friend of my dad who had a, a son who was uh, really good at BMX, and so my brother wanted to try, and I of course wanted to try also. Uh, and then I liked it; I could win some races uh, in front of the guy, so yeah, it was uh, it was nice. And then I never stopped cycling. Actually, I started mountain <laughs> bike, and yeah, then it was uh, yeah, never stopped. <laughs> 
And what did the, the youth uh, years look like before you went to Sunweb? Because I'm guessing you didn't just jump into Team Sunweb instantly, right? No, indeed. It was actually pretty smooth. Like, uh, So I started on the road in 2012. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I was uh, at a good national level. We didn't have any way uh, some uh, yeah, international races. We had the, My first international races was the EOF, which is the European Youth Olympic Festival in Utrecht, it was, in 2014. Yeah. So then I got already like a first international feeling and... Uh, then in junior was the real, uh, yeah, real time where I, where I could uh, start to show myself. And after the first uh, world championship in junior uh, in Richmond, I was like in the breakaway and uh, yeah, with uh, Chloe Daggert when she won, uh, yeah, she, pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then I got a hunger flat, but still, uh, actually, the DS of uh, of Leaf Monture at that time contacted me on uh, Facebook. I was not sure if it yeah. was real, so I had to make some uh, <laughs> to make some Google <laughs> researches. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, so we were in contact from there on. And then I did a lot of training camps with them, actually, when I was second year junior. And yeah, it was pretty natural for me to sign with them when they wanted me to. Yeah, so you were not sure it was real. Are there actually like fake, fake DSs on the internet? Yeah, I don't know. But I was like, okay, is this like a real account? I really had to check. Yeah, yeah. I get that. I get that. I get that. Yeah. In 2022? Pretty good season, I would say. Last year, you mm-hmm. finished fourth in the Tour de France Femme. You won the Volta Burgos. And next to that, took home a wonderful stage in the Giro Don. And my question is about that last race for a second. The Giro Don was a race with ups and downs for you, where yeah. when it comes to GC, the general classification mm-hmm. in the Cessna stage, wasn't, wasn't your best day. But then no. towards the end of the race, you ended up winning a stage. How does that weigh up to each other? How do you feel about a race like that afterwards? Yeah, it was uh, special because I was really aiming for GC and um, yeah, I was pretty not confident, but I had all uh, yeah all what I needed to to have to to get a good GC. But then uh, I had a heat stroke on a, a GC day, or yeah. like it was not even like a super hard day. Uh, uh, like there was no mountains or stuff, but I just had a heat stroke, so I ended up in a in a group behind the leaders. So I was pretty far, and I was like, okay, I'm out of GC. So the f- first hours after the stage, I was pretty disappointed and really sad and. But then I really had to directly switch and say, okay, now it's done. Uh, what can I do? And then I was directly thinking about the, the stage seven, which was uh, yeah, the queen stage with the mountain finish. And I was like, I, I just want to win that one now. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. then I could win it. So it was pretty special. And yeah, I was pretty proud afterwards. I can imagine. I can imagine. Sur de France Femme, one of the most important races of the season and arguably your career, I would dare to say. Yeah. Do you feel like the resurrection of the Women's Tour de France came at the exact right moment in your life? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just perfect. Like we were really aiming for having a Tour de France the the last years and yeah, fighting for it. So when I heard the news uh, the year before that we would get one, I was really happy. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm not yet at my uh, at my best uh, career peak, but yeah, I was uh, already aiming for a good uh, GC result. So yeah, it was a really good timing, and yeah, I could feel uh, yeah a lot of French people uh, got into women's cycling, and we had a lot of people watching and cheering. So it was really great. Do you feel like it had a great effect afterwards? As in, uh, we hear a lot of people talking. Uh, myself, I spoke about oh the the Tour de France femme major effect in women's cycling, gonna do a lot and so forth, but. Do you feel that? As in, do you have more Instagram followers afterwards, or how does that work? How do you how do you know if that if there's more fans out there? Yeah, actually, Instagram wise, Facebook, whatever, I had a lot of followers, but I think mostly <laughs> what I could uh, realize was the media attention. First, before we had like ten times more media attention than yeah. before, and also afterwards, I got still a lot of uh, requests. Uh, and also like a lot of people were sending me messages still like three months later to say, oh, thank you for the emotions that you gave us during Tour de France. So that was pretty special. Uh, also a lot of uh, small girls who were sending me like uh, yeah, drawings or letters. So that was Aww. also yeah really cute, actually. And we didn't have that before. So I think now that was a big change. Uh, and still now, if you talk to someone, like if you pass someone on a bike and you talk a bit and he asks, oh, you're professional. And you say, yeah. And he says, oh, you did Tour de France. And then I was like, yeah. So then and then they actually watch like most of the people. So, yeah, yeah I think it changed. And they are watching more women cycling now. That's great to hear now. If you look back at when you started in the peloton, when you entered the peloton and you look at it now, do you feel like women's cycling is moving in the right direction? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I joined uh, in 2017, uh, the professional world, uh, it was actually not so professional. I mean, I was lucky to be in a team uh, which has already a, a men's team. So we had a really good structure. 
But if you talk about salary, I think not so many girls could uh, earn their life uh, thanks to cycling. So, and then we got the World Tour uh, uh, contract, uh, which was a big change because everyone could get a salary uh, for the girls who were in the World Tour. So that was a big change. And now if I compare, yeah, in a, yeah from 2017, there's really a big difference compared to that. And also so many more teams have a good structure now. And yeah, it's not so many years, but it feels like uh, yeah, a lot has changed uh, compared to the last 10 years before. When it comes to like the, the calendar and how it works and so forth, there's so many races being implemented now. Does it feel like too much sometimes? Because I swear it was like double of like four years ago at this point. Yeah, and I think also for the teams, it's a bit of a struggle now. I mean, you see now some uh, teams like, especially uh, so my team had to miss uh, Australia for multiple yeah. reasons, but you can see there's so many races and we are not uh, like big teams. We are most of the time between 14 and 17, I think, something like that for the World Tour teams, which is not so much. And also staff-wise, we don't have uh, so many staff compared to the to the races, uh, to the amount that we have. So I think it's a bit of a struggle so far, but maybe the next years it will be a bit more filtered and yeah, maybe better for the for the teams. Um, and it's also noticeable when it comes to the amount of riders that show up in races for, for World of Teams. I swear that I just saw the Cat Levin's Great Ocean Road Race start list and half of the teams are with four riders. So mm -hmm. does that change the dynamic of the race? Because like, if you look at women's cycling, I feel like breakaways happen less than in men's cycling. Mm -hmm. Is that because there's less riders to control a breakaway or what do you think the dynamic is behind that? I think that can play a role. And I mean, especially in stage racing, I think there's so far not really breakaway days. I mean, I had one in Giro, but this was still, I mean, I was the only one to survive the breakaway. So you cannot really yeah. count it like that. Uh, I think every stage the girls want just to win it. So the GC uh, riders, because we didn't get so many chances to to have uh, yeah, media attention and stuff. So every time, every race, uh, we want to be winning the race. And I think that's maybe what makes the difference. And normally if we have breakaway, like for example, if I say in a classic, like Newsblad or whatever, there's most of the time a breakaway, but it lasts like 40K and then the race is yeah. already on and, until the finish. So yeah, I think it's just, <laughs> it's maybe just a style of racing, which is different uh, compared to the guys. I don't know if it's, yeah, because of the amount of riders, maybe not. Yeah, okay, I get that. Now, we've also seen the parkour chain a bit change a bit when it comes to the routes and so forth. I feel like over the last few years, maybe it's just me, that there's more pure mountain stages coming. And maybe that's because there's more races coming that we see more pure mountain stages. But also in the Tour de France Femme, there's that, that dedicated mountain stage. Do you feel like that benefits you as a rider? Or would you see yourself more as still versatile because you still get good results at Amstel Gold Race and so forth? I think I'm still happy about it. Like before, it was only Giro where you could really have a proper mountain finishes and a few races, yeah. of course. Uh, but now we have uh, way more chances. And I think, yeah, for me, it's good. And I want to keep improving on that because I'm not yet like with the very best. So I want to be physically still a bit stronger. But I think, yeah, I also like when it's a bit more like complete. Uh, so, for example, with the TT in the end of the Tour de France, I'm, I was happy yeah. about that. Uh, to yeah have a bit more for all round uh, type of riders and yeah but I also like the classic type of races uh, but I'm not really punchy so sometimes it's also hard for me uh, on these kind of stages so yeah, yeah it's a bit in between. When it comes to the time trial, I think you got 11 for something at the World Championships in in the ITT. Do you feel like that's something where you can still step up? For example, do you think you can still spend spend like some time in a wind tunnel to get that better or? How do you feel mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, I mean, I think Worlds was really not uh, my best time trial last year. I really didn't have mm -hmm. good feelings, but I was the year before sixth when it was uh, really flat in uh, in Belgium. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, my TT is uh, quite good and I want to also improve it, of course, with now the, the TT in the Tour, especially the team uh, puts more focus on it because last year we didn't really have a TT goal, only the, the worst, but for the team it was a bit less... Uh, interesting of course and we really focused on the tour and giro last year so we didn't really have uh, much time to focus on it uh, but i also sometimes do with the french federation some testing uh, because it's also for the olympics so it also plays a role in that so maybe this year i will uh, do another winter testing but yeah already with the team last year i did uh, some no. track testing and we had a big change in my position because uh, we changed bikes to the to the disc bike so yeah, but I really like time trolls and it's a yeah, really good uh, discipline because you have so many things that you can uh, improve. So you, you're you never perfect in it. So yeah, I like it. And it's a major way to gain on people that aren't the best at time trolling. So it's very useful, mm -hmm. of course. Now, yeah. going back to the Tour de France Femme 2022 for a second here, Marina Wibus transfer announcement. 
publicly came at the exact start of the race, like the perfect timing, of course. Eh? <laughs> now, yeah. for you as the riders in Team DSM, were you aware of that or was that also like a bomb that dropped in the team? Uh, I mean, I was a little bit aware, but most of us, uh, I think, were not. So I, it was pretty much uh, not expected. And for Lorena, yeah. it was really not so nice from the journalist that he uh, yeah. published uh, out, especially when she was winning the stage. But uh, we had a really good, uh, actually, reaction from everyone. We just accepted it. And she also had a speech in the bus and the DS also. And yeah, it was, uh, It's. I mean, it's how, how it goes sometimes. And it's also cycling. So um, but we never had really problems uh, about yeah. that. Like we, yeah, it was pretty fine actually during the tour. We we said we anyway she's still in the team, so we it's not gonna change something. And yeah, it was fine actually. Now you're you're the the climbing side of the team, but when it comes to the sprinting side of the team, losing Lorena is quite a big a big deal when it comes to the amount of victories. But Charlotte Cole is also quite fast. Like she's incredibly Indeed. fast. Yeah, you yeah. You think I mean, she can step up? I think so. I think uh, we have a lot of trust in her, and she's. Uh, a super committed rider and she's uh training real well and really serious and yeah i'm pretty sure she will uh yeah she will do her best and i'm yeah i mean already last uh, years in training camps uh, if they were like fresh both of them uh, they could uh they were a bit the same uh sprinting oh, so nice. yeah i think if she can survive a bit better the hills and that she's less tired in the end of the race i think she can uh yeah i, I don't want to say uh, too early but probably she can beat lorena <laughs> or at least we will try to, to make uh, the best lead outs uh for her so that she can uh, she can win and yeah i hope for her uh, and for the team that she will win races now, Liana, Florch, and Lorena are all three leaving the team. That's like three major like team leaders, mm -hmm. I would say, depending on the races, of course. Do you feel like there's more pressure on you to deliver when it comes to results now? Yeah, I think so, for sure. It's a bit more of a responsibility. I'm yeah, more like a clear leader compared to before, where I was uh, most of the time sharing uh, leadership with Liana, just not for the GC most of the time, but for all, other, all the other races uh, we were sharing the responsibility and Flotch a bit more for the classic. So it's for sure a big change, but I was yeah ready for that. And we, we have a really strong uh, new girls coming in the team. And I think the ones who were already getting stronger last year uh, will uh, yeah also be really good this year. So I'm not really worried for this year. I'd expect that Tour de France Femme to be the, the big deal again in 2023 20, uh, for you. But what races are you lining in front of that and maybe after that? Yeah, uh, we have uh, with the team the three big goals with the Vuelta, Giro and Tour, which is uh, ambitious, but it's not like the guys, of course, it's not three weeks, it's just uh, just one week and 10 days for the Giro, so it's normally possible, especially because uh, Vuelta is in May and then you have some time to recover for July, a little bit like this year, actually, uh, if you take, for example, Burgos instead of Vuelta. It's a bit the same uh, kind of calendars. And then I yeah. will have, uh, for sure, other races uh, to target, but a little bit less uh, important goals. Uh, but I will be also a bit more free, like in the Ardennes, probably, and yeah, some other races where I can uh, probably try some things and yeah, to race for the win. What do you think about the calendar changes? As in, for example, the Vuelta moving to May, the World Championships being August. earlier? Earlier, yeah. yes. Early Two August, months earlier. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about those changes? Does that yeah, change anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's often actually changing. You have the Olympic year, which is different. Yeah. And then I think now it's because of the word, uh, like where we have all the cycling uh, events. But yeah, I think it's just, uh, yeah, you have to think a little bit different uh, for your calendar. But it's not, I think for women's cycling, not a big difference. Like I said, like Volta is in May, but before we had Burgos. But now the thing is there's three races there. Uh, so you have uh, Volta, Burgos, and Izulia. So you for sure have to choose. I mean, maybe some girls would do uh, three races, but I don't think so. Uh, so yeah, you, you have to miss some races compared to before where you could do almost everything. At least when I started, uh, like the big favorites they were doing, uh, they were almost not missing any World Tour races. Yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> now, you said combining the Girodon, La Vuelta, and the Tour de France Femme, is that more combinable because the Vuelta goes earlier or do you think it's harder to combine or is that even like do you need to pick for a specific one or can you be at level for all of them I think uh, you can be at level for all of them like you can pick uh, for example in the end of April with the Ardennes until the Vuelta then yeah. I will probably have some rest and then we'll prepare again for July I think it's uh yeah that's possible uh, and I learned some things from last year, like, for example, after the tour, I uh, stopped for a bit, but then I had actually some struggles to find uh, actually a good shape until the end of the season. I was a bit uh, fighting for it. So 
I think this year we will maybe uh, take a bit more rest uh, in August. Maybe I do worse and then afterwards resting. Like, yeah, a little bit different, but I think you can be uh, having too big uh, peak shape. Now, you spoke earlier about all uh, the, the grand tours of women's cycling are not three weeks. Mm-hmm. Should they be? Or does that not matter? <laughs> it's a hard question. Huh? But uh, I think uh, it would be good already maybe two weeks. I think that could be possible. And then you for sure would have to choose. I think uh, doing three would be a bit like the guys, only a few would do it. Yeah. Uh, but I think two weeks could be a good one, like uh, between a mix of uh, yeah, of, uh, one week and three weeks uh, that could be in the middle. And yeah, because now three weeks is maybe a bit too much for the small teams. But on the other hand, I think, uh, yeah, women are really endurance. So I don't think that would be a big problem. Maybe it would be a bit different also racing wise. Because now, even in Giro, it's 10 days, but it's almost 10 days full full on racing. Uh, there's, like I said, like almost no breakaway days or easy days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think if it was two weeks, it could uh, it would also be a bit different. And we would not race from kilometer zero until the end, uh, every stage. Yeah, I think so as well. But then mm-hmm. again, I, I'd have no rest at all between between the Giro and the, and the World Championships. Yeah. I'd be dead by the end of the season. <laughs> That's a challenge or so. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, at least I'm not riding them. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> but um, about the Tour de France Femme for a second again. Uh, you finished fourth, I've said it earlier, in 2022. I guess the next step is trying to step on the podium. But mm-hmm. to get on that podium, are there specific changes that you apply in your training compared to last year that you're like, oh, I learned something along the way. I should try and do this differently to maybe be that tiny bit better? Yeah, a little bit like uh, until now, I was really focused on the long climbs and stuff. And mm-hmm. I think now, uh, like I said, I'm already on a good level and I can still improve it. So I will, I'm still working on it. But we also added some more intensity work uh, during the winter, like almost directly after off season. I did already some uh, some yeah pretty high uh, intensity efforts. So uh, to get a bit more of explosivity and yeah, not really explosivity, but like uh, on repetition of climbs of like four or five minutes this kind of efforts which, which were a bit uh, my weaknesses so far so yeah, yeah hopefully it can uh, help me this year to be uh yeah really with the best and try to get to the podium especially when it comes to the parkour of this year where you've got two two and a half hilly stages i'd mm-hmm. say or maybe three it depends on how hard it's ridden and yeah. then you've got the tourmalet and the time trial at the end what does it mean to have the cold tourmalet in this race I think yeah, uh, it's yeah. First, it's nice because it's Tourmalet. I've never ridden it actually. I almost yeah. never been in the Pyrenees, so yeah, I was happy when we when I heard about that stage. But I think it's yeah, for sure there will be some difference there. But sometimes we are pretty equal in level with some girls, like you saw with Casia or Cecily last year. Uh, yeah. So I think the difference can be made in the, actually the most tricky stages, like uh, the one who are like with uh, punchy finishes or yeah. the one which is like uh, with all the small hills, I think this can be tricky. Like this year, actually, the podium was made uh, pretty much in the stage two uh, when uh, there were like a group uh, going in the last lap. So in the end, not even in the mountains. Uh, so yeah, I think it can be the most tricky and maybe not even the Tourmalet. Maybe Annemiek will still have five minutes, that's possible, but at least for the, for the other places. <laughs> well... <laughs> I've got nothing against Anamig, but it has to stop at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. when it comes to the parkour again, like we've got it being a bit backloaded when it comes to the races. In the last few days or are the hardest days when it comes to the big mountains and the time trial, the more GC centric days. Do mm-hmm. you feel like that's a good thing? Or do you think it should be more spread across the race? No, I think it's good. And I think especially because it's only eight days, then you uh, really yeah. get with that. Uh, yeah, uh, when it's really back to back, I think you can uh, really feel a difference uh, with riders who can recover well or not. So I think, yeah, for me, normally it's better because you, I can normally recover quite good, like fatigue resistance. Uh, yeah, it's one of my skills. So I was happy about that. And I think, yeah, you can get more difference compared to if it was more spread out and you can recover. Everybody can recover better if it's uh, more spread out. So no, I think it's interesting. When you go into those races, do you feel like the goal initially is I want a podium or there is there some sparkle of of like, ah, oh, maybe I can beat Anamik and Demi here? Hmm. 
I think you have to see day by day. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, you have to really want the best out of yourself. That's always what I, what I try to to tell myself. Like, you just do everything what you can do. Have no regrets. Just try everything. And if there's a opportunity to to go for better and podium, I will for sure try. I just want to finish the the Tour de France. Even if I'm like sixth and I have no regrets, I would be yeah, yeah satisfied. So yeah, that's the the most important. I think. So yeah, Julien, I wish you the best when it comes to the Tour de France. That <laughs> that podium is coming. I can feel it. <laughs> I, I was already I hope hoping so. it would happen in 2022. <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> but we got to build up gradually. Eh? Indeed. So uh, indeed. I want to thank you very much for being on the podcast. It was a, thank you. a nice conversation. We learned a lot more about you and about how the inner workings of Team DSM are going into the, the 2023 season. And uh, I guess good luck going into your first, which is your, which is your next race? Not announced yet, but uh, it's Ooh. soon. <laughs> well, we'll see it very soon. Can't wait to yeah. see all on the social media of uh, of the team. Thank you very much. Cool. And uh, <laughs> to everybody I listen, thank you very much for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.